Great. Well, you said that would be a short intro, and it was even shorter than I was expecting, so you've all caught me by surprise a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks for coming along this morning um, to hear about what you'll miss in AWS and how to find it. Um, the clicker is already not working. Come on. Okay, we're going to do it that way. Oh, there we go. Right. So the clicker is now working, and we can continue. Um, my name's Mike. Um, I'm a software engineer and CTO at a company called StuRents. Um, check us out if you're interested um, in working for us. Um, I'm also a skydiver and a northerner. Um, so if you can't understand anything I say, come and ask for clarifications afterwards. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, at M1KE, and we've got a joined-in link there. I'll put that up at the end of the talk again. Uh, if you're interested in giving some feedback, um, if you like me, tell me. If you don't like me, well, it's up to you, really. Um, so, cloud is going to change how we work. Uh, it's really cool. Um, it's cool enough that a lot of you have come along to see a guy you've never heard of before talk about it this morning. Um, it's cool that even people with real jobs, like administrator and manager, have heard about it, as well as every developer, from the script kiddie right up to a senior vice president of engineering or some equally overblown title on LinkedIn. But this means that you might get pressure to move to the cloud without knowing why. As we're going to see, moving to the cloud can look simple but it's often anything but. Now, what I want to focus on when I talk to you and what my company focused on when we moved to AWS wasn't the hype or the tech or all the jargon, but the business case. Not just why move to the cloud, but can we do it in a way that makes sense to our modern, hopefully agile business practices? So firstly, why are we even going to move in the first place? We identified three things um, that were the reasons to move to a cloud service. Scalability, um, availability, and durability. So scalability is a, a simple one. Um, it's as your business grows, as your use case grows, can you um, improve the uh, c compute capacity or storage capacity or other um, processing requirement of your system over time without costly migrations, uh, downtime, getting new contracts, working with new providers um, every few years as your business grows. Availability, this was a big one for us. Um, that would probably be the same for most people. Some businesses might be able to do without it. But availability means, is your service online? Can your customers access your product? Availability is going to be crucial for anyone who's selling things, because any time you're down, you're not selling. Um, it's going to be crucial for anyone providing a consistent service to people, like software as a service platforms. If you're down, all your customers are down. And durability, fixing things that break. Um, obviously, we're all wonderful software engineers that never make a mistake. Um, but every now and then, we accidentally hire someone who's not a wonderful software engineer, and they make a mistake. Um, and things break. So can we fix things that break? Can we recover from problems? Um, and so where are we coming from? This might be the same for a lot of you. Um, you might be on a single server, um, a LAMP stack. Um, sometimes you might have separated out to maybe a separate database, so you've got two servers. These might be VPS um, in various com hosting companies. There might already be a sort of minor cloud provider, like DigitalOcean. Um, or um, you might be uh, on a traditional bare metal box that you own in a data center somewhere. If you've gone a bit further, you could be on um, hypervisors, where you are running multiple machines, but still on a single piece of dedicated hardware somewhere. So you're still vulnerable to some of the same failures um, that can happen to any sort of dedicated hardware in a data center. Um, data centers are great things, but you can have problems with them, no matter how much they show you how nothing can ever go wrong in this data center. Uh, I know of one recently that someone drilled through both of their redundant power supplies at the same time. Um, <laughs> so you can't always be perfect. Um, another thing we have to be prepared of as we go into AWS is acronyms. AWS is full of acronyms. AWS is an acronym. Um, and the coolest ones amongst you might know all the acronyms, um, but I won't assume that. I definitely didn't. So these slides are going to explain it all. And if it gets too much for you, there's a nice icon of a plant. Um, and we're not going to be going into um, tutorial detail here. So this isn't a sort of how to in a how to move your entire service to AWS. I don't have time to do that. Um, but I, uh, I'm going to offer you our pathway, the reasons we made our decisions. Um, and afterwards, there'll be time both for you to ask some questions about me, um, about how we did it. Um, and also, um, I'm planning to do a sort of impromptu workshop sometime later in the day if you want to come along and get a bit more hands-on with your own business case. And one final thing. Is this really the best way to do this? Um, the answer is no. Uh, what we're doing here is not best practice. This isn't what a AWS certified solutions architect will tell you. Um, this is the journey from where you are now, uh, which could be in a variety of different places, through to being up on AWS fully. 
Um, and there are times when business case and best practice do line up. So things like security, uh, making sure your data is protected and backed up. Um, but other times, we want to move more slowly. We need critical components onto AWS to protect our business availability and scaling requirements. But we can then move other parts and change our practices later. If you were to go up to your boss um, or your investors or whoever else is a stakeholder in your product and say, by the way, we can't do any work for six months. We're training the entire team in DevOps and moving everything to AWS, so we'll see you uh, in the next year. They are not going to be too happy. Um, they're probably just going to say no. So this is a way you can present a case to move onto AWS in a way that works for your business um, and works for your development team. So this is all about what we're going to miss. Um, and let's begin with your server being on. Um, Amazon give a service level agreement of 99.95%. This equates to about four hours of downtime a year, which I think is pretty good. But there's a clarification in this SLA, which says this only applies if you've built redundancy into your setup yourself. Um, so to talk about what redundancy means, we need to understand how AWS is structured. Um, so we have our first acronym explainer slide. Um, so we have EC2. Uh, this is Elastic Compute Cloud, basically servers. <coughs> they call them instances, but they're, they're servers, they're virtual machines. Um, RDS is the Relational Database Service, which is servers but with a managed SQL on top of them. Um, all flavors of SQL are offered. Um, and then AZ, this is an availability zone. And that bears going into a bit more detail. AWS is split into regions, and it moves fast. This map that I put in my slides uh, a few months ago is already out of date. There are already new AWS regions that are open um, and being built at the moment. Um, the numbers in each of the circles are the number of availability zones per region. An availability zone might be made of one or more data centers. So you can see, if we look uh, to uh, the middle of the graph, um, that Dublin, uh, which is known as EU West 1, has three availability zones. This means there are three independent hubs of AWS data um, providers and storage in Dublin. Um, at any time, AWS reserve the right to simply have an AZ switch off. So if they need to do maintenance, if something goes wrong, they are totally happy to just kill an availability zone without much warning. If they know they're going to do it, they will try and give you warning. But if something goes wrong, they would rather preserve their power um, and take the AZ down than give everyone warning and maybe risk something else going wrong. Um, so we have to be able to avoid the loss of an availability zone. So if your idea of moving to AWS is we're just going to do exactly what we did with a VPS, um, or a dedicated box, but start servers on AWS, you might face a server suddenly going offline without any notice. <coughs> so we can't do that. We have to avoid the loss of one availability zone. With EC2, this involves launching your instances in multiple availability zones. So when you launch one from the console uh, or command line, you can say, I want this to be in EU West 1A or 1B. The idea is if you have servers in multiple availability zones, you are protected if one of those availability zones goes offline, and you're now covered by that 99.95% service level agreement. With RDS, the database service, this is even simpler. Um, there's a multi-AZ tick box. So you tick that, and automatically AWS creates extra database servers for you in other regions. So if your main one goes offline, your system fails over with around one to two seconds consistency, um, which should be pretty good for most use cases. Um, again, they don't expect it to happen, and they'll try and transition you slowly if they can. Um, some services, it doesn't matter. So if you're using S3, um, which some of you might already be, because it's very separate from a lot of their other services, for data storage, that's already replicated across all availability zones. Um, they copy each uh, object, I think it's around seven times. Um, so you're very safe. Same with Lambda, which we're going to talk about later, and their DNS service. Obviously, you don't have to create redundant DNS servers, or that would be going a little bit too far. Once we realize we need to manage servers, to even start to use AWS reliably, things already become complicated. This is where you hit that first problem in the business case. So we have auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is AWS's core mechanism to make the servers and therefore your products highly available. Um, it's built from a simple process. You create an image, uh, which is a configuration, uh, so your server config, um, plus a snapshot of your disk. So your operating system, all your files, configs, everything else. You then create a launch configuration. This tells AWS that you want this image to be used with this size hard disk, networking, um, and this size of instance. Um, and then you have availability zones. Um, you choose whether you want to launch in one. You, you don't. You want to launch in multiple. Um, and then you can say how, what you want the balance to be. Do you always want one instance per availability zone? Are you happy with one every two? Um, it's up to you to how you want to balance that. Um, and AWS then starts instances for you. 
Once it started instances for you, in the event that one of them goes down, uh, AWS will simply start another one up. And that could be going down because of your own configuration problems. You could have broken something. Your server could just crash. And if AWS notices it's crashed, it will simply take it out of service and give you a new instance. Um, so it's great if you are running um, specifically like hacky programs that might break a server. You can just have your server built much more durable by putting it in an auto-scaling group. Um, but there's a problem. We talked about LAMP. That's the one box that runs all your stuff. Well, now you have multiple boxes. So where does your traffic go? And you're going to miss mapping an IP to a domain name. We're all familiar with this format. We have one server. Um, so our DNS looks something like this. You have your domain. You get the IP from your provider. You stick it in. It all works. Unless we want to tell our users, can you guys access um, a.domain.com and you guys b.domain.com um, with lots of subdomains, that's not going to work for multiple servers. Helpfully, AWS still has us covered. We've got load balancing. Load balancing, again, is a fairly simple process. Um, most of my processes I've managed to break down into four steps, which shows how well AWS does things. Uh, you choose a target group. This can be instances that you're managing manually um, or auto-scaling groups. Uh, it will work with either. You add some rules. So the simplest rule is forward everything that arrives at your load balancer on port 443 to your servers on port 443. Um, you can map them between. So you can have everything that arrives on your HTTPS port on the load balancer just go to your HTTP port on your server. Um, and then you can add a whole load of complex routing rules in between. Does the request contain this information? In that case, send it to this server. Um, you add some health checks. This is a way that the load balancer can just ping your instances to say, hey, are you still there? That can relate from a simple um, return of a HTML file, if you just want to be simple. Or you could even have your health check um, do something like connect to your database uh, or connect to another crucial service you're running so that you know that if traffic is going to your instance, it's running your application in the way you intend it to be run. If a server fails a health check, again, AWS can take it out of service and give you a new one. Or at the very least, not send traffic to it and alert you that something's wrong. Uh, load balancers are across multiple availability zones. By default, you don't have to say anything. It's called a load balancer. Um, one fairly early pitfall is it doesn't actually do any balancing. It's a randomizer. So if you have certain processes that might be activated through a web route that are very intensive on your processor, maybe you're rendering um, a, a, some sort of video files or, or doing lots of image processing when someone uploads something, um, you could still get one server being overwhelmed. So don't just assume that if your server can handle sort of 75% load, that all the load of one specific thing won't go to one server and still bring it down. Um, it's a load randomizer, not necessarily a balancer. Um, the default storage for sessions in Apache and PHP um, is on disk. But now we have multiple disks across multiple servers. Um, again, uh, if your users are accessing your site with um, their sessions and they hit multiple servers, they're going to be asked for a new session each time they sign in. So unless you're already using something like stateless um, login uh, with JWT, um, you are going to find your users suddenly getting logged out for no apparent reason. And the same with anything in your application that relies on them storing data into the session. Uh, once again, AWS does have us covered with sticky sessions. You can tick a box, and this puts a cookie on your user's browser that says, anytime I come to you, send me to the same server. Obviously, if that server goes out of commission, all your users will still get signed out or lose their session data. Um, but you probably need to handle that in your application anyway. Um, most applications should handle a user losing their session for some reason. Um, so you can use cookies, or you can store something to disk if you need it. Um, with too many servers, though, we now have to deploy code to a lot of servers. Um, it will take you a bit longer to rsync code to two servers than one, but it will take you even longer to rsync code up to 20 servers. Um, and deploying that way has been a consistent feature of most development environments for years. And so you'll miss using the file system. Um, each server has its own disk, um, but they don't talk to each other unless you start setting up some complex routing. And again, we're trying to do this the simplest case for our business. Um, and it's not just code either. If you're using a CMS, um, which many of you will be, given the most popular CMS is generally written in PHP, we're using WordPress, using Magento, that will store all your users' content to disk. Unless you want to start rewriting your CMS to tell it to store it somewhere else, you're going to have a challenge with your migration. Your own apps can react to what may be slightly easier, but it can still be a big challenge. So we have some storage acronyms we've got to teach you first. Uh, EBS, this is Elastic Block Store, basically hard disks. They do like to come up with fun names for things. Um, EFS, Elastic File System, this is a networked hard disk. You'll notice it's also the most expensive storage option per gigabyte. 
um, and S3. This is, I say, the one that a lot of people will already have heard of. This was the first service AWS released um, and has become very successful throughout uh, the world for disclosing private information publicly. Um, so EFS volumes are a network hard drive which you can choose to mount onto uh, any number of instances, no matter what availability zone they're in. Um, so they're stored across all availability zones. You don't have to worry about that. Um, there is no need to set a volume size. You're just paid for what you use. Um, and they have write consistency. So this means that when you write a file to EFS, it only tells you, yes, I've finished writing, when it knows it's replicated it wherever it needs to be replicated. Um, and it scales with the number of stored files. If you go into uh, an instance once it's got an EFS volume mounted and do the um, Linux DF command, you get to see the available storage size on EFS, uh, which is 8E. I had to look it up. That's exabytes. Um, that's a lot of zeros, bytes. I don't know if anyone's ever managed to fill it. I guess you could just set DD running and see if it uh, completes, or if AWS call you first. Um, but you know, good luck if anyone wants to try. Um, I will retweet you if you do. Um, so. Unfortunately, this is becoming a bit of a habit. We have a few problems now. Um, with EFS, files upload slowly, and PHP files execute even more slowly. So you're going to miss speed. Um, why? We talked about EFS's characteristics. It has write consistency, and it's networked across multiple locations. So write consistency, every file has to let you know it's ev everywhere it needs to be before it tells you it's done. Otherwise, your application could go, yeah, that's stored. One of the EFS nodes could have a problem, and you've got this inconsistent file system. Um, for a single file, this is fine. The, the write consistency takes you know, extra milliseconds. Um, I don't know about your source code <coughs> base. Um, our code contains about 17,000 files. Um, that suddenly, the little time on each one takes a lot longer. And our sync to our server that used to take a minute, maybe two, took 20 when we first moved on to EFS. Um, that's not really affordable in your average development environment. Um, and then network read. Uh, reading over a network, again, adds a network connection. Um, it's a fairly simple network connection, but the latency is noticeable. If you're reading one file, you won't see it. Um, PHP applications <coughs> tend to use a lot of files. If you load an average um, root in a Symfony application, you're going to call one to 200 different files um, that get loaded in via the magic of auto-loading and the fact that we don't think about what we're loading anymore. Um, and that means that your file read delay slows down the entire application. Um, file handling in the apps also affected. Again, for single file uploads, you won't notice this, but if you're letting users upload big um, sets of documents or zip files and un unzipping them, then you're going to find a problem uh, with your application as well. Uh, so we tried a few ways to solve these problems. Um, we tried atomic deployments, uh, PHP opcache, and then eventually S3 deployments. Um, so we basically we tried a few things, and again, as the theme of this talk goes, they didn't work. But I'm going to talk to you about them anyway. Atomic deployments, you might already be familiar with this. Um, some <laughs> deployment agents, things like Capistrano, uh, will use this, where you um, upload files somewhere uh, to a timestamp directory, and then when everything is in the correct place, you flip a symlink that's pointing to your, um, your code that says, this is now the active version of my website. Um, and that's generally a, a, a really good pattern as well, because it means you don't get this slight delay where you have code from different versions of your application on at the same time. Um, again, with an rsync that takes a few seconds and a low user base, you might not have a problem with that, but this is a good idea even if you're not doing AWS and you're on one server. Um, so you send files to EBS, which is your connected hard disk, which is just really fast. Um, they're SSDs. Um, you never really notice any right problems with them unless you're doing some crazy video encoding. Um, and then you start your instance synchronizing to EFS. Now, this is still slow, even from AWS, but at least now your machine that you're developing on um, or your machine that's doing your continuous deployment isn't having to do the work. Um, it's not having to do this really long file copy. You can just leave it going and have something notify you when you're done. Um, and then once it's done, you switch. And the problem is that deployment is still slow. If I start a deployment, I still have to tell anyone who's waiting for that deployment, oh, yeah, guys, that'll be done in half an hour. People don't understand a half an hour wait time when it comes to computers. They assume everything is instant. So when you say, yes, it's done in half an hour, they're very confused. Um, so we found that, especially with things like bug fixes or p features that people want urgently or trying to do a deployment at 6 o'clock and trying to go home. Um, so it is still slow, but your machine is free after the first copy, which is a little bit better. Then you have the PHP speed issue. Um, you might find you already use PHP opcache. It's enabled on a lot of default configurations. Opcache basically means that you run a PHP uh, script, and it caches all the generated opcodes from passing your PHP. And that way, the next time that runs, um, it doesn't have to do this massive read of the entirety of the Symfony framework to render your page. It just goes to the existing um, opcache. And so this does solve the slow performance due to the file read time on EFS. 
Uh, by default, opcache validates timestamps. If you've been following along, you'll notice that that's going to kill our performance again, because it's going to have to validate the timestamps on these 100 files anyway, which is the same with the network read. Um, so you have to turn that off. But now you have the issue that your opcache is fixed. If you're not validating timestamps, your opcache will keep the same opcodes cached forever. So you need a way to reset. Um, so we came up with a very simple way, which was uh, you have a system running a cron. Every minute, you check um, if a timestamp file that you upload with a deployment has changed. If it has, you curl a local PHP root, which runs opcache uh, reset. And that will log a reset in your opcache, refresh everything, and everything will cache again. That does mean the users who access your site immediately after will get the slowdown for the first few minutes until opcache has cached everything. So you do get the slow first loads. And opcache is now critical to your application working. So any issues with opcache missing something, not working in a certain case, and there have been cases with specifically complex um, PHP that, that opcache can, can go wrong on. We had one recently that we were chasing for a while. Um, Opcache is now critical to your app, even performing normally, let alone speeding it up. Um, so we have to change our plans. There are a few other deployment mechanisms that are um, suggested by people who are experts um, in AWS. Um, blue to green deployment um, is basically a common pattern where you put up servers um, and then uh, deploy your application to those and then flip over where your load balancer points to. And Amazon have their own tool called Code Deploy, which will do this for you. Um, we had a look at this, and it seemed great. Um, it will create a new uh, group of servers for you, put your code on those, and only when it's ready will it move all your users across. The issue with that is that you can still have a problem of consistency. There can be a time when users might be accessing two sides of your code base. Um, this creates problems if you ever wanted to do something like a database schema change, um, where suddenly queries that are running on one code base might be hitting a database that's already changed its schema to match the new code base, and you get errors. Um, it's not helpful for different types of servers. So if you're running your same code base across multiple servers for different uses, such as one server for serving web and one server for running batch jobs, you might have them configured differently. Um, Blue-green deployments via code deploy can't handle that. They have to target a single auto-scaling group. At the moment, Amazon might change this. Um, and it's harder to run post-deployment code. So if you have things that need to happen at certain stages in your deployment to um, your SQL databases, to files, to anything else, you're going to find it harder with the blue-green deployment because of the um, hooking into when it's completed. So this didn't work for us either. And we came up with our own method, deploying via S3. Um, we wrote an agent um, which can monitor for deployments uh, on S3. And then it can synchronize this across servers. The principle we used was that you upload code to an S3 bucket, which is fast, and you upload a timestamp saying, this is the latest deployment I've done. You then check um, your instances, check your S3 timestamp on schedule, or you could go further, and S3 has an event system, which you could use to send an event to your servers, but that has a whole extra problem of where you route those events to. Um, once your server is aware that it needs to do deployment, it creates a lock and synchronizes all your files to the current instance. And this lock, um, it can be read by all the servers. So when servers have different times to synchronize, they can each check all the locks from the other servers in order to all switch your code at the exact same time. This avoids having problems with things like um, front-end caches, where if you're using uh, long-life uh, caches for your JavaScript, CSS, or images, and then changing uh, a query string timestamp to invalidate them, the last thing you want is to change that timestamp, and then caches go and pick up the old version of your files, because now you have some really inconsistent bugs that are very hard to trace. Um, so EFS doesn't cut it for code, um, but it's still really good for shared content. So your images or your files are still fine on EFS until you can move to something else. Um, we're also going to miss modifying servers on the fly. If you thought deploying code was hard, just try going to patch the latest OS level of vulnerability um, or installing a PHP extension or patching a vulnerability in a PHP extension. Um, on your own server, um, we all do this. We sign in by SSH, we make some config changes, we sign out and hope everything works. Um, on AWS, you can't do this, because servers can just vanish and be recreated by autoscaling. So your config needs to be versioned. There are tools to manage your configuration as code. Um, but again, we've talked about we don't want our entire team to have to go off and learn DevOps. Uh, hopefully, a lot of our teams are already fairly good at this kind of task, simple server administration, basic sysadmin work. Um, they do it on their own machines, I imagine. So rather than upskilling our team, what can we do? I've got a few more acronyms before I can tell you about the solution. So we have an ASG. This is an auto-scaling group. We've talked about these. LC, we mentioned that talking about auto-scaling. This is a launch configuration. So it tells you how you want your instances to be created in your auto-scaling group. Um, and AMI, uh, or AMI, 
some people disagree on the pronunciation. Um, thoughts afterwards. Um, this is an Amazon machine image. So this is your configuration um, and your disk snapshot. And so we have a master instance. Um, the helpful thing about AWS is they don't charge you for instances which are switched off. You pay for the storage, but the storage is relatively cheap. Um, so if you have an instance that spends most of its time switched off, you don't get charged any money. Um, that's different to a lot of other cloud providers who will charge you even if your instances are switched off. Um, so you can have this master image, uh, which you can turn on and make config changes whenever you want. You turn it on, you change it, you edit your configurations, and then you switch it off. Once it's off, you create a new image, and then you build a launch configuration from that image, and then you tell your autoscaling group to use this launch configuration. Now, when your autoscaling group starts new servers, they're going to be using your new configuration. Now, remember, this isn't about deploying code. This is about app, uh, operating system level changes, which hopefully you're not doing on a daily basis. Um, but it's still very important to, be able to make these changes, especially if there is a new security vulnerability. Um, but we would like to automate it because that whole process seems slow. You, ha you have to turn on an instance. You have to SH in, do your work, turn it off, image it, put it into your autoscaling group, kill your old servers one by one. That's a lot of work. So we have Lambda. Uh, Lambda is currently the new hotness in AWS. Everyone's talking about serverless. There's still a server. It's just not one you control. Um, but it lets you run single scripts um, on schedules or triggers. Uh, it costs basically nothing, especially for automated work. Um, if you put a web front end in front of it and send all your requests there, it, it would start costing you something. Um, it runs Python um, and a few other lesser languages, uh, but not PHP. Um, so you can use two sets of Lambda functions in order to handle uh, rolling out your Amazon machine images into your autoscaling groups. Um, so one uh, will watch a instance, your master instance, for it being stopped. Every time it stops, this function just helpfully goes and makes an image of it for you. So you don't need to worry about going and clicking that Make Image button, working out what you call it, everything like that. And they generate in about five minutes. You then have a second function, which puts this new AMI into service in the autoscaling group. It finds the latest AMI, uh, it copies it, um, it uh, puts the uh, launch configuration together, and tells your autoscaling group to use this one. But you now have all these instances in your autoscaling group using your old AMI. So you can then use scheduling, um, or just instructions to your autoscaling group from Lambda, to tell it, OK, I want more instances. The new instances will launch with your new AMI. Then you have a schedule which says, OK, 10 minutes after that, half the size of my group again. And your autoscaling group will kill the old instances first. So now you have, with about 10 minutes of creating your changes, you have a full new configuration. You've not had to learn any new tools. This can all be done from within AWS's control panel. You're going to miss cron. Uh, we thought we were nearly there, didn't we? Um, this is part of many applications. Um, it's used for loads of different things. Uh, and the tasks can be minor, um, statistics, um, or they can be pretty major, handling your payment processing. Um, so not having your crons is a bad thing. It's probably even worse to run your crons multiple times across different instances, um, because whilst you can maybe check things like locks, if everything's running at the same time, you might miss something, and customers being charged twice for things, or having twice the number of items arrive, or twice the number of emails arrive from you, um, is going to be pretty upsetting. Um, and instances can start and stop at any time. So you'll have one of your instances running a cron, and then it goes down. So what's the state of that, that cron job now? Does another one pick it up? How do you handle these things? So we looked at a few ways to get around this problem. Um, one of them was a centralized lock. So could we have all our instances running crons and just have a lock uh, using EFS that you lock when you begin a process and you hope that if there's tiny sort of millisecond differences between instances that they notice each other first? We thought that could work, um, but it seemed a risk. We didn't necessarily have provability that the locking would work. Um, what if you check for the lock, and then you, by the time you created a lock, someone else has missed the check for the lock, and you get some really nasty timing issues. Um, you could just set your instances all about a few seconds apart in their clocks, but that has another problem. Um, we also looked at queues. Uh, Amazon has a queuing service, so we thought, well, you could have a separate instance that just pushes tasks to a queue, and something else can pull them off the queue at the other end. Um, that did seem like it was a good idea, and that was recommended by our um, consultants in AWS. The problem with that was, once again, we're at the stage of having to design an entire new system to do something we're already used to doing. So we came up with an easier option. We have a control instance. The control instance can use the same shared code base, um, pulled off S3. It can connect to the same database, the same EFS volume, um, but it's a different image. It's not a web server. 
Um, and we can use auto-scaling with a fixed group size of one. And this means that the cron server should just stay up. If it does go down, um, the auto-scaling group will start a new server only after it's been off. And we can do this with cron, whereas we can't do it with web. With web, obviously, if your instances are booting, that's five minutes that you're down for. That could still be critical to your business. But with crons, um, generally, you can sustain a few minutes of downtime because your cron can just catch up when it's back. So you might have to think about how your jobs run. If you have jobs that run once a day that are essential, you might want to check they have run a little while afterwards in case something's gone wrong with your servers. Um, the way we dealt with it is using a system called CloudWatch, um, which I will introduce later, um, and sending metrics to CloudWatch that tells us the server's still active. If those metrics fail, we get an alert, and at least we can go and investigate what's happening. We've got this control instance, um, but how can we SSH into the instances um, if they keep moving? Uh, you've got this auto-scaling group, things are going up, things are going down. Um, you don't know where your instances are. Day to day, they might have different IP addresses. But if we want to do monitoring of our crons, if we want to check files on the EFS volume, um, or access MySQL um, through the instances without um, publishing a MySQL by PHP MyAdmin or opening MySQL ports publicly, which I wouldn't recommend, um, then SSH into your instances somewhere secure is a really useful tool. Um, so our servers change IP, and we want to access them without opening the AWS dashboard and seeing what the current IP is. We've got a few more acronyms here. Um, EIP is an elastic IP, basically a fixed IP address that's given to you, it won't change, and you can choose what server or network interface it's assigned to. And we also have Route 53. That's not an acronym, but I thought I'd use this point to mention it. That's Amazon's DNS service. So that's how um, they handle all their um, name services, and their DNS is really useful for um, things like load balancing. Um, so I had a uh, system using EIPs to map to our domains. But actually, whilst I was writing the notes for this slide um, a few weeks ago, I realized there's actually a better way. This is one of the wonderful things about AWS. Even writing a presentation telling you how we do AWS, I learned some new ways to do AWS. Um, it does mean you're always on your toes, and someone could always come along and tell you everything you're doing might have been wrong, uh, but it's really exciting to just keep learning. So the AWS CLI. This is a Python package, which you can install um, using pip, and it takes your API credentials. Um, everything in AWS can be done via CLI. Basically, their dashboard is just a big interface to their back-end command line system. So anything you can do in dashboard, um, fetching data, changing things, you can do via the CLI. Um, a really helpful part of learning CLI means that you're also learning their software development kits. So if you're using the PHP interface, that's just named after everything from the CLI. Um, and uh, their authentication. So they have a system called IAM, which is a user management. Um, if you start using AWS with any uh, regularity, you will grow to hate IAM. Um, it is defining policies which allow certain users to access certain things. Um, they have recently released a nice editor for IAM policies, which makes things a lot less headache inducing, but some things are still complicated. Um, try and set up multi-factor authentication on one of your users if you uh, don't believe me. Um, but if you are using the CLI, you'll learn all these helpful commands you need um, for IAM. So when you run a command, you then just add that command name to a role uh, or a policy in IAM so you can allow users to do the thing you're trying to do. Um, the AWS CLI returns JSON, and that means that output can be passed using something like JQ. Um, if you haven't used JQ, it's an awesome little command line uh, <coughs> JSON parser and search system. Um, so we can run a little system like this, uh, where we say, AWS, describe my instances with an instance ID, which can be our control instance, or you can put in a more complicated filter, like a tag or an instance size. And then using JQ, we filter to get the public IP address. Um, stick that into a bash script and have it SSH into whatever instance it returns from that, and you now have easy SSH access into your server um, without using any other um, part of the AWS stack. Um, if you do do this, be warned. Um, when you connect to different servers twice on the same IP, your SSH will freak out um, because it thinks it's being spoofed. Um, you can remove it using the SS keygen command. Um, there are maybe ways around this I've not looked into yet. Um, I thought about uh, there are instant startup scripts you can run uh, which do things like set a host name. So could we actually modify the startup scripts in order to um, do something like set a common set of names for us? Um, but then where would you get those names from? It, it got a little bit complicated. If you have a solution for that, please do tell me. Um, you're going to miss viewing your logs, though. Even though we can now SSH into our instances, we still have a lot of them. Um, 
I don't know how you currently manage your logs or tracking things. Um, genuinely, at the moment, uh, sorry, at the moment, well, before we moved on to AWS, um, the wire way of handling logs on our servers was to SSH in and stick tail on at the start of every day and just watch them coming through. Um, it's especially fun to watch a DDoS attack in real time through your access logs um, with no power to do anything about it. Um, so you've got your system doing logs at system level. You've got things like auth logs. You've got syslog. Um, MySQL has its own logs. Um, and most likely, your application is logging a lot of things already. Um, so you can um, change your configuration, and new servers appear. So all your old logs that were on the old servers just vanish. Um, so all this history of access, who's accessed what, what errors did we, did ha we have happen, just go away. But you still want to monitor everything. Now, you could rewrite your application again. All your logs just get sent somewhere remote. But once more, we have the business case. Do we actually want to rewrite our whole application, how we're used to doing things, to deal with a new world of working? Um, if you already stream logs to a third party, maybe you're already fine. Um, but again, we're dealing with this minimal case. So how do you get your logs back? Well, currently, we've said we have system logs in Valog. Um, you might have your own logs. Runtime errors can appear in different places. So sometimes they'll appear in the Apache log. Sometimes PHP will have its own log. Sometimes there might be exceptions. Your application logs somewhere else. Um, cron sometimes have problems. For some reason, often logs them in var mail. Um, if you ever found that one, there's a massive mail folder with the root name and tons of logs for years of crons that were failing and you never knew. Um, but with multiple servers, nope. You can't access these logs because, as we say, they could vanish at any point, and it's very hard to monitor them. So we use CloudWatch. Uh, I already mentioned CloudWatch before. CloudWatch is basically AWS's way of monitoring all of your stuff. There's loads of features in CloudWatch. You have metrics, um, dashboards, alarms. Um, I could probably do an entire talk on CloudWatch, so come back next year for that one. Um, but this is just going to look at logs. CloudWatch has an agent. Uh, you install this agent on your servers. You put it into your AMI that rolls it out across all your servers. And then you tell CloudWatch where my logs are stored. So I want to log uh, my Apache logs. I want my auth log for SSH. Um, I want various of the logs that I care about from my application to send into CloudWatch. Um, the agent is really useful because it will just track your logs as you make them. Um, you can point your agent at a single log file or a directory. So any new files appearing in that directory should get logged. It's reasonably good at handling things like log rotate. So if you're rotating logs, it's not going to then re-log your old logs when they get rotated. Um, but every now and then it does. Um, but if you want uh, multiple log files from a single directory, to be sent into different log streams, because maybe it's an application level log, and you're just, your developers just drop files somewhere, and they log something, um, you'll end up with them all in one stream. So totally unrelated parts of your application now, again, have to either be rewritten to log to a directory, or you have all these logs in one stream. Um, we didn't like that. So I wrote uh, an extra log checker. So it's sort of the AWS logs agent agent. Um, and what this does is this handles in a bit more intelligently your file system. It analyzes your log files, and then it rewrites the AWS logging agent configuration if it sees a difference. Um, and uh, we've recently added the ability to also add instance IDs to your, to your log streams, so you can not only tell where a log is coming from, but um, which instance created it in the first place. Um, and so if we want to be real professional loggers, um, we can look at the AWS logs package. Um, this is something, again, I found out whilst writing this talk. Um, and the best loggers use CLI. So the logs package lets you um, have a CLI into your logs. Um, you could do things like, uh, like tail, basically, your entire logging infrastructure. So logs from 10 servers can get streamed down to a CLI on your own system. Um, so you can easily view them in real time. So again, for watching things like errors, um, for watching that exciting, fun, fun DDoS, um, or just for monitoring general things, you can do it. You can use this for search. Um, it's a really great tool, uh, really nice coloring and things like that, uh, if you're interested. Um, so again, if anyone wants help setting that up, um, just drop me a tweet. Um, I've been doing that recently. So where are we now? We have an application that is hopefully running on AWS. We've had a few challenges. Um, we've had some slowdown. We've had a lot of questions from the board of directors as to what on earth we're doing and why so many acronyms. Um, no one really knows what they're paying for these services, but we'll work that out in the end. Um, so why have we done all this? Well, we get to the good parts. Um, and sorry to any JavaScript fans. Um, we have a lot of new flexibility um, with AWS. There are a lot of new tools we have, as well as the ones we talked about at the start, the basic infrastructure level flexibility. 
AWS is a constantly expanding platform. I don't want to sound like some sort of fanboy. Um, a lot of these things will apply to Google, Google Cloud Platform um, or Azure or anyone else who tries to seek to compete with them. Um, but the strength of these kind of services is that they are always advancing faster than the things we build ourselves. So if you want um, bulletproof backup, if you want the ability to analyze massive amounts of data um, in a short amount of time, you can start sending things, your, your information into Elasticsearch or into other services AWS offer. And every time that you think a service is really hard to set up and use and configure, you can guarantee that in about a year's time, AWS is going to have automated that process for you. So each, each time, each year, each um, time they release new features, our ability as developers just goes bigger. We have to do less of the boilerplate <coughs> of managing servers, of SSHing into things, um, and more of building our applications and our services. One of the things I realized fairly early on um, is that actually AWS is seen as a cloud server provider. It's not. It's a cloud data center. With AWS, you have the ability to create an entire data center architecture if you want. You can create networking systems. You can create firewalls. Um, you can use NAT gateways to route traffic to different places. You can make different subnets that talk to each other. You can create bank-level security in your own little application just by firing a few things at the AWS console uh, or CLI. Um, and it really does offer a huge amount of flexibility. Um, the challenges that, that would at one time be very um, insurmountable to a small development team are very easy with AWS. We had an API client um, who we started working with who told us shortly after our integration was finished that the API could only be accessed over HTTP, and that wasn't secure, which was good news to us. Um, but that to be secure, we were going to have a VPN permanently into their internal intranet in order to access the API. I mean, you know, who ever heard of REST, right? Um, with a previous provider, we'd have had to say, well, we can't do this. We now have to talk to our server provider. They have to set up networking systems, a VPN. It's going to cost us a lot of money. Who monitors it? Uh, with AWS, I looked up a guide called How to Make a VPN with AWS, and I followed it, and I sent them the configuration at the end, and we now have a VPN into the network. It's still a stupid system, but we could actually do it without extra expertise or extra money, even though this requirement was just dropped on us at the end of a long project. Um, so AWS is a cloud data center. Um, you will find more and more ways to use it once you're based on their platform. Um, Terraform. Uh, Terraform is something you might not have heard of before. Um, this is one of these uh, configuration as code systems. So Terraform uh, allows you to declare what you want your AWS infrastructure to be. So to declare your DNS, your S3 buckets, your instances, uh, databases, networking, users, everything. And then it will go to AWS and say, this is all the stuff I want, what's currently there, and what do I need to change? And it will handle it all for you. Um, it's a great thing. They've made their own little language. Um, there's a syntax highlighter for Terraform available for PHP Storm. Um, and Terraform uh, genuinely changes the way you actually use AWS. Um, I don't know if you would get the same benefit from going straight into Terraform. It might be helpful to use their console for a bit first and sort of learn the basics before you then add Terraform. I think once you've been using the console for a while, moving to Terraform suddenly changes your life in a new way. Um, if you want to learn more about Terraform, um, Thais is doing a talk at 2.40 in the main track um, and talking about that and a few other DevOps tools. Um, so I'll be there um, to try and unlearn everything I've already learned. Um, so come and join us for that. Um, and CloudFront. Um, you can use CloudFront right now. If you're not using CloudFront, maybe take some time at lunchtime today to go and start using CloudFront. Um, CloudFront is an edge caching system. Um, simply put, this means that it caches things from your server near to where your users are. Um, so static resources, basically. So if you're serving JavaScript, you probably are. You're probably serving some massive overblown JavaScript libraries. Go and cache them. Um, you're serving CSS. Go and cache that. Serving massive image files that no one's ever bothered to optimize. Go and cache those, too. Um, CloudFront can be put in front of your existing site right away um, and simply cache requests for certain resource types. Um, it takes a bit of configuration to start with, but by a bit, I mean maybe two hours. And then you suddenly have this massive load reduction on your server because your server isn't trying to work out how to constantly serve 10 million JavaScript files anymore. Your server can do what it's there to do, which is produce dynamic web content. Um, CloudFront is also a really useful tool, even in front of your dynamic web content, um, because you can apply Amazon's firewall technology to it. So if you are someone who comes under um, DDoS attack, if you come under lots of people trying to do SQL injection um, attacks automatically on your system, um, use CloudFront uh, with their firewall system, which allows it to do things like strip out malicious SQL um, from your requests. Um, so CloudFront will save your server load, 
and it'll improve browser performance for your users. Um, and that especially matters if you're global. So if you're a global business serving people in Australia, um, whilst your site content is quite small and gets there quickly, your images and your CSS and JavaScript are going to take ages to get there. CloudFront caches them near to your users. Um, so like, I can't mention it enough, go and, go and do it now. I think CloudFront probably saved our life this year um, before we could finish our migration to AWS. Um, I went and accidentally had a baby. Um, and that suddenly took me out of work for a while. Um, and that meant that during the busiest time of our year, no one was there to manage, manage our infrastructure. Um, helpfully, we deployed CloudFront the week before. Um, and that meant that this massive amount of load on our servers just died. Um, and our servers went down to a much better baseline load. So yeah, I, I can't advocate for it enough. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, don't clap yet. Um, and uh, once again, you can find me on Twitter, at Mike. Um, I'm on Slack. The PHP Northwest Slack group um, is open if you want to, an invite to that on phpnorthwest.org.uk. Um, and OG AWS. This is the um, open guide to AWS. It's a GitHub repo you can contribute to if you have your own feedback. Um, and they have an amazing Slack channel with a really helpful community. Um, lots of them are based in London um, and lots worldwide. So uh, join OG AWS if you want some real good advice. Um, that's where I get most of my information. So you'll see me every there daily asking questions. Um, if you've liked this, tell me on joined in. <laughs>